Good afternoon, everyone. I cordially welcome you all for the 13th lecture for the short course on cultural linkages towards an Asian ideology 2022-2023. Today, we are focusing on the low dispute resolution of education. I have now the honor of introducing our guest lecturer, His Lordship Honorable Justice Yasanta Kodavada, Judge of the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka and the President Council. Honorable Justice Yasanta Kodavada was called to the bar as an attorney at law in 1988 and since then has held numerous important appointments in both the local and global arena. A few of such appointments held by his lordship include President of the Court of Appeal of Sri Lanka, the second in command of the Criminal Division of the Attorney's General Department, Additional Solicitor General, Legal Advisor to the Financial Intelligence Unit of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, visiting lecturer at a number of institutions, including the Sri Lanka Law College, Universities of Colombo, Sri Javadanapura, Kalani, and KDU, and counsel representing the government of Sri Lanka in an anti terrorism investigation conducted by the Metropolitan Police of the United Kingdom. In addition to this, his lordship has rendered his service and expertise to the Criminal Investigation Department of Sri Lanka, the High Court and the Magistrate Court of Sri Lanka, and the Judges Training and Institute of Sri Lanka. Our esteemed guest received his primary legal education at the Sri Lanka Law College and received his master's degree in public international law from the prestigious University College London in the United Kingdom as well as a postgraduate diploma in forensic medicine and sciences from University of Colombo. His lordship has also presented and published many national and international level papers on themes such as criminal justice response to child abuse, legal framework relating to prevention, detection, investigation, and prosecution of money laundering and national security laws of Sri Lanka, Sir, we are profoundly honored to have you with us here today. We are warmly welcoming you to deliver this lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear students. Um, this afternoon, I propose to speak to you on, on law. Uh, I'm mindful of the fact that only a very small number of you uh, are presently studying law as LLB undergraduates. So the vast majority of you uh, are not studying law. Uh, and therefore, I want to keep this very simple. Uh, nevertheless, uh, go into certain details that will help you not only in your studies, but also in life, generally speaking. So. I, I have selected three areas which, in my view, are interconnected. And, and you will realize that uh, towards the end of my presentation, I will give you a general description of what law is all about, what is law. Um, we will then move on to the second part of my presentation. And that's to do with dispute resolution. In other words, uh, all of us, all of us, all the time, uh, encounter various disputes and conflicts. We will look at them in some detail and, and also look at various ways that we ourselves have developed to resolve disputes and conflicts, how to settle them, how to um, accomplish our objectives, notwithstanding the eruption of a dispute or a conflict. So we will look at dispute resolution mechanisms. They are called dispute resolution mechanisms. And thereafter, we will take just one mechanism, uh, which is the third part of my presentation administration of justice. Administration of justice is, uh, I will tell you upfront, it is a mechanism 
for dispute resolution. So we will look at administration of justice and uh, students, this presentation is aimed at not only you from Sri Lanka, but for the benefit of all the other students joining in this program and particularly those from Japan. So I'm, I'm um, pitching this presentation to cater to an international audience. But nevertheless, um, we will select certain examples that are more relevant to Sri Lanka than to other countries. So the topic once again is law, dispute resolution mechanisms, and out of them one being the administration of justice. And, and I think it will make things more comfortable to you if you proceed on the basis that administration of justice is what happens in court, courts of law. Administration of justice is what happens in courts of law. Um, let me move on. So law, um, what is law? What is law? For a moment, think about it. What is meant by law? Mm, law, basically, it is a set of rules. So rules means what? If law is a set of rules, what does that really mean? We are bound to comply with the law. Rules are mandatory as opposed to option. Uh, so law is binding on us because it comprises of a set of rules. Um, law is essential. No society can um, proceed in an organized manner, in an undisruptive manner, unless there is a law. So Sri Lanka has a set of laws. Japan has a set of laws. United Kingdom has a set of laws. All 194 countries, as well as six other autonomous territories. So we have 194 countries and another six autonomous territories uh, have their own laws. Law is essential to, to any country, to any society, or for that matter, to any individual. Um, what does law actually do? The law compels us as human beings <coughs> to conduct ourselves in a particular way. So in other words, when we do something, we need to do it in accordance with the law. In accordance with the law. So what is its impact on us as individuals, as human beings? It takes away to some extent our freedom. It takes away our freedom because there are laws that are applicable to us and we have to conduct ourselves, behave in terms of the law. So it, we, we cannot, in society, in life, in general, we can't behave the way we want. So it is said that the law imposes certain controls, imposes certain controls on our freedom, on our behavior. All what is not controlled by law is one, and I think it is important to note that there is just one thing that can't be controlled by law. And what is that? The only thing that cannot be controlled and we have complete freedom over is what? Is our conscience is our inner thoughts, is our internal beliefs. So what happens inside is beyond the control. 
but what you speak what you do how you do things can be regulated or controlled by law um the law controls not only us as individuals it controls states countries it controls governments it controls corporations and companies organizations associations it it controls everything. it controls countries as well so countries themselves however independent a country might be is bound by certain laws um so laws are different in its um, structure what it seeks to do and what its impact is differs from a law to the other now take for example criminal offences criminal offences basically what it does is it imposes prohibitions on us we can't do certain things because doing so will amount to the committing of an offense killing another human being is one example stealing somebody else's property is another these are all offenses criminal offenses and they contain prohibitions um some laws of course confer on us rights rights and duties as well uh, take for example the law related to human rights in the sri lankan context we would say the law relating to fundamental rights so human rights basically confers on us rights of course there are corresponding duties if i have a right you as well as the state will have a duty to respect my rights similarly if you have a right i have a duty of respecting and adhering to your rights um there's also another distinction in laws some are referred to as substantive laws and the others as prohibitions there there are laws can be broadly separated into two groups substantive laws and procedural laws substantive laws basically confer rights rights and duties procedural laws prescribe the way in which one needs to attend to certain things in other words the procedure to be followed um basically laws are made by people who have the power to make laws it is not everybody who will have the power to make laws we will we'll look at that in some detail when we move on to the next slide um what is the source of laws what is it based on how are laws made what does you look at for the purpose of making a law different things uh, if you look at various laws there are human values based upon which laws have been made there are religion and cultural values embedded in laws there are requirements of society requirements of government requirements of countries based upon which laws have been made and of course necessity the absolute necessity to make a law in a particular way these are referred to as the sources of law the sources of law <clears throat> we must also remember uh, there are there are various 
rules which we respect and comply with. Um, some of them stem from religion, some stem from our own culture, others from ethics, human values, uh, social norms. Uh, we conduct ourselves according to such sources also, but those are different from laws. So yes, other than laws, there are other things in life, in society that have a bearing on our conduct, um, such as religion, culture, general human tendencies, um, values, ethics, etc. We generally do comply with them. Uh, civilized people do comply with them as well. But they are different to laws because laws are mandatory. We have no option. Laws, laws, it is compulsory to comply with laws. Who makes laws? Who makes laws? Think about it. Who makes laws. I will frame it somewhat differently and ask you, who has the power to make laws? Who has the power to make laws? Uh, so laws that are applicable within a country is referred to as uh, domestic law. They can also be referred to as national law. They are made by people who have the power to make laws within a country. And such people would include monarchs, kings, queens, monarchs, uh, legislatures like parliaments, state assemblies, federal parliaments, etc local government institutions like municipalities, urban councils, Pradeshia Sabha in the Sri Lankan context. So these are all bodies that are empowered by law to make laws. So what are they? They are empowered by law to make laws. Then you have not only bodies like the parliament, but also in terms of the constitution of the relevant country, you get the head of state, the head of state, who is also empowered on certain occasions to make laws. Um, the president, now take for example, the president of the United States of America, he has power to issue presidential proclamations, the president of Sri Lanka in terms of the constitution, uh, as well as in terms of a very important law called the public security ordinance, has the power to make certain presidential orders, rules. Uh, they are referred to as emergency regulations. Emergency regulations. Then, in a group of countries that are referred to as common law countries, common law countries, the judicial judges also make law. Uh, that's referred to as judge-made law, um, not in every country, but in common law countries. What are common law countries? Common law countries are countries that belong to the British Empire during the colonial. So that's 48 countries that belong to the um, Commonwealth of Nations, former colonies of the British Empire, and of course, the United States of America. So these United States of America and the Commonwealth of Nations um, 
basically are referred to as common law countries. And in common law countries, the judges of superior courts, in the course of pronouncing judgments, they develop and they contribute towards an area of law which is referred to as the common law, common law. Uh, and that's important. Then you have international law, international law. Earlier one, domestic law, then you have international law. Basically, international law is made by the international community. Countries, representatives of countries get together and they formulate, they recognize and formulate international law. International law is twofold. Treaty law, that is where they uh, negotiate and develop conventions or treaties. Treaty law. So you have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. You have the Law of the Sea. Mm -hmm. Numerous conventions and treaties. Treaties are made by two or three countries acting together, like a contract between countries. Then there is customary international law. So customary international law is the law that has developed over a long period of time by virtue of countries conducting their affairs in a particular way and not doing certain things. So over a long period of time, that conduct of countries gets recognized as customary international law okay mm. now can i can i ask whether you have any questions at this point of time can we see whether there are questions on the chat box Uh, can I ask the organizers to see whether there are... Uh, sir, there, there, there is no question, sir. Okay, no, right. Thank no you. Up to now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we will then move on to categories of law. So law has classifications, categories of law. I have separated law uh, into two broad areas, private law and public law. Mm, private law uh, would be law of persons that basically it relates to uh, relationships between persons. So we have these different categories. Law of persons. Law of persons is the law that regulates human to human relationships and conduct. Law relating to marriage, law relating to maintenance, the law relating to children, um, all forms of human relationships are governed by the law of persons. The law relating to land, and that is referred to a land law, ownership, uh, allowing somebody to use property. Uh, oh, um, finance law, the law relating to financial transactions. Company law, as the name indicates, the law relating to companies commercial law, um, and of course, uh, when 
disputes arise relating to any of these areas of law, uh, there are mechanisms within law recognized by the law on how to resolve those disputes. This is only a very primary listing of laws. Um, if you really look at it, there are numerous other areas of law. Then you have public law. Public law has everything to do with, with government and state power and the duties of government and states towards its citizens, towards its corporations, etc. And public law can be broadly divided, uh, divided into constitutional law, the law relating to human rights, and some will say the law relating to fundamental rights in the Sri Lankan context, criminal law, and also, once again, um, when disputes arise in the area of public law, mechanisms for judicial review how the court will resolve the dispute uh, pertaining to public law. So this is a very basic, uh, it's not an exhaustive list of types of laws, a very basic uh, preliminary list of law. Okay, so now we move on to the second area of my presentation, disputes. The second area of my presentation, and I would think this would be a good moment uh, for, for you to raise any questions you may have. Can I know whether you have any questions? Now, uh, students, I will move on to the second part of my presentation, we are going to look at disputes. Um, what are disputes? Just think about it. Can you think of the last dispute you had with anybody, either with a batchmate, with a friend, with a member of the family, uh, with a loved one, uh, with the state, with administrators of your educational institute, <coughs> with an unknown person on the road. Hmm? Uh, disputes can occur everywhere <coughs> with anybody. Um, can you reflect on the last, in other words, the most recent dispute that you encountered? Take, take a minute and think over it. With whom was it? That's question number one. Number two, regarding what was the dispute? And what happened to the dispute? Uh, how do you react to the dispute? Think about it. You will see that disputes are very common. It happens all the time in our private lives, in our official lives. Uh, we ourselves encounter disputes. We see other people encountering disputes. Hmm? And in fact, you get some disputes uh, with even animals. Take, for example, the human elephant conflict in our country. Those are disputes between uh, villagers and elephants. Disputes. Uh, but more often than not, disputes occur between human beings between people who are known to each other. They either have a relationship, some association, some transaction between us, or complete outsiders with whom there has been no previous contact. So it, they, it's a very common occurrence in life. 
now in in response to what i asked you to do if you look at the last dispute that you encountered uh, in life you would see it is a reflection the dispute is a reflection of a disagreement a disagreement between two or more persons relating to a specific issue the dispute is a disagreement if you and the other party agree there cannot be a dispute but if you and the other party disagree that disagreement on a particular matter specific issue means particular matter regarding a particular matter gives rise to a dispute so you want it in one way the other party wants it in another disagree um and if you look at various matters in respect of which disputes arise you will see that they relate to property you get people fighting over property money various the assets and resources uh, rights like human rights fundamental rights power exercise of power human relationship relationship to partners in life uh, identity me you we have different identities uh, so disputes can relate to almost anything and what i have listed here uh, are some of the more common factors upon which disputes arise it happens all the time they nothing on um so now when you reflect on this last dispute that occurred in your life with whom regarding what and how did you respond what did you do to the dispute when you encountered people react or respond differently um a reaction is something that happens very automatically and a response is something that is very measured you think about it very carefully and you respond um three there are three basic ways in which human beings respond to disputes we ourselves do it all the time i'm sure you do as well uh, sometimes we engage in fighting fighting means this that type of fighting physical fighting as well as argumentation uh, verbal fights hmm? why both sides want to win the fight unilaterally you want to have it your way the other party wants to have it his way so that's a fight another way is we do that unintentionally we sometimes choose to do that we fight or we don't respond at all it is called avoidance you let the other party have it his way you accept defeat you don't even bother to respond it can happen sometimes certain fights some certain disputes relate to very trivial things so it's basically not worth responding sometimes the relationship is more important to you maintaining a relationship is more important than fighting over something very petty so you avoid you turn a blind eye you don't respond at all you allow the other party 
to win. Hmm? It happens to us all the time. We choose sometimes not to fight it out and just let it be, resulting in victory to the other party. And then in between fighting and trying to unilaterally win and avoiding and thereby unilaterally allowing the other party to win, in between there are various other forms of very peaceful dispute resolution. They involve the two parties communicating with each other. They talk it out. They send letters across. They prepare documents and exchange. So they are all peaceful, no fighting involved, peaceful forms of dispute resolution involving what? Communication between the two disputant parties. Communication between the two disputant parties. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a list. This is a list of various forms of various peaceful forms of dispute resolution. Human civilizations over a long period of time have developed these mechanisms. Negotiation, mediation, conciliation, contractual adjudication, arbitration, and judicial adjudication. These are the six main methods used by uh, civilized human beings, by organized society to resolve these groups. They're all peaceful. Yes, parties want to win, but do so in a civilized manner, in a peaceful manner. Some of these mechanisms don't involve any law whatsoever. They don't involve any law. Some do, some do, to varying degrees. This last mechanism in this list, Judicial adjudication is what happens in courts. Judges like us are presented with disputes. There is a lot of law involved. And our duty is to resolve those disputes or decide on those disputes through a mechanism referred to as judicial adjudication, judicial adjudication. The first three, negotiation, mediation, and conciliation are simple mechanisms, hardly any law involved. And we do that all the time. Every day we do that. You and I, everybody else in society, engage in negotiation, mediation, and conciliation, most of the time, not even knowing that we are doing just that. Uh, negotiation is, it happens every day where you go to a shop to buy a particular item. Uh, the sale price is indicated by the seller. You don't want to buy it at that amount. You try to bargain with him and try to reach some settlement regarding the sale price. That is a negotiation. That is a negotiation. 
So negotiations are generally between the two parties concerned, the two disputing parties, and they try to work out what I would refer to as an amicable settlement. They try to reach agreement by generally coming midway. Then mediation and conciliation, I'm, I'm not going to take time because that's really not the topic. Uh, mediation and conciliation involve the two disputing parties and a third party. Either a mediator or conciliator, he tries to resolve the dispute between the parties. So you may have a dispute between two students in the university. Uh, possibly a lecturer may try to intervene and try to resolve the dispute between the two students through either mediation and conciliation. In mediation, the parties are allowed to develop a solution to the problem. In conciliation, if the parties don't develop a solution to the problem, the conciliator recommends, so there is no judgment by him, he recommends as to how the party should resolve, in his opinion, the dispute. Uh, contractual adjudication is complicated. I'm not going to deal with that. Uh, arbitration is equally complicated. There are a lot of law involved. And of course, judicial adjudication. Uh, one party goes to court. happens in court all the time. So administration of justice is the overall system developed and run by the country itself, by judges, for the purpose of causing judicial adjudication of disputes. So administration of justice is a system. You have courts, you have laws, you have lawyers, there are judges. It's a full entire system catering for judicial adjudication of disputes. That is what happens in uh, courts. So administration of justice is, is the entire system and administration of justice occurs in court, in court. Um, so this is what happens. You, you go to court in search of justice. Uh, justice, not according to the whims and fancies of the judge, but justice according to law is delivered by courts through this system called uh, judicial adjudication. Uh, and that entire court system and the law and the personnel involved, the whole of it is the system of administration of justice. This is merely theory. It is like a definition of what uh, administration of justice and judicial adjudication is. Um, you may want to just take one minute to read it. Dr. Premanathan, can I know whether the students are entitled to have the PowerPoint presentation? Yes, sir. Right. 
so um, i will i will email this presentation so yes, that please, uh, yeah please email it to me then i will circulate uh, through a common sure. we have a common email address sir oh sure sure right. thank you sir so you really don't have to take this down uh, just look at it it is more a definition of uh, administration of justice Look at this sequence, sequence of events. This is what happens in a court of law when you take a dispute to be resolved by court. Through what? Through judicial adjudication. So you, there is a dispute and disputes relate to two or more persons. One party wants the dispute to be resolved say regarding ownership of land hmm? or regarding partitioning of land or regarding a matrimonial dispute hmm? or relating to the committing of an offense hmm? or regarding money lent but not returned. There is a dispute and one party to the dispute goes to court. He, he wants the dispute to be resolved through judicial adjudication. He files a case. The first party who goes to court files a case, seeking a court order to have the dispute resolved the way he wants to, the way he wants to. Now, he will send out summons of the case to the other party through court. And then the other party has to respond. He can't remain silent. He must respond to the summons and participate in the court case. If he doesn't, the judge. If he doesn't, the judge will make a ruling in favor of the original party that went to court, the first party. So now the other party has to also go to court participate in the case, in the hearing, the judge will hear both parties and the judge will decide on the manner in which the dispute should be resolved. He announces his determination, his decision, and that is referred to as the judgment, the judgment of court. So remember, uh, adjudication is not for amicable settlement of disputes. Uh, give me a moment. Now, who participates in this hearing? Participants, you have a judge, He's like an umpire. He hears both parties and decides. You have the disputants. They are the people who have encountered the dispute. They are called parties to the case. They are also referred to as litigants. The litigants are represented by lawyers in court. They are legal representations. They are referred to as litigators. There are witnesses who testify on behalf of each party. Some of them are lay witnesses, ordinary citizens, lay people. Some are official witnesses and others are expert witnesses. And then no court can function without court officers. There'll be law enforcement officers like police officers, probation officers, prison officers, etc. They are all law enforcement officers who are associated with the administration of justice. Uh, prison officers are people who come from penal institutions. Uh, administration of justice students occur in public. That is a 
unique feature of judicial adjudication. It doesn't happen behind closed doors. It happens court and watch proceedings. It is the media that will report what happened in court, at least in cases involving public attention. There are certain cases where the public wants to know what happened. And therefore, media professionals also play a very important role in the administration of justice. Yes. As I the general, the general public, other than the parties to the case and witnesses, public, uh, also have the entitlement to go into any court, court and watch proceedings. So these are, ladies and gentlemen, the participants in the administration of justice. They all have a role to play in the administration of justice. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is like the structure Of court hearing, you have the two parties to the dispute. They are represented by their lawyers, and through the lawyers, they present evidence to the judge and make submissions. And the judge decides on the manner in which the dispute needs to be. Result. This involves the, the process, as I said earlier, the process, the procedure related to a court case is determined by procedural laws and the rules based upon which the judge must decide the case. The rules of law is determined, is, take, is contained in substantive law. So that is the difference between procedural laws and substantive laws. So administration of justice is this. Administration of justice is, as I said, a system. Um, the system is created and found in the law. It is an occasion where disputes between parties are resolved not according to absolute discretion of the judge, but in terms of the applicable law. And this entire mechanism of dispute resolution in court is referred to as judicial adjudication. Judicial adjudication. Now, uh, so procedural law is how a court case is heard, the procedure to be followed, the applicable rules based upon which the judge will decide the case is contained in the substantive law uh, and factual matters. Uh, one party will say that the land is owned by him. The other party will say, no, the land is owned by him. And, and how do you prove those diverse positions? Those diverse positions are proven by presenting evidence to court. So this is the structure of that. So you get parties, witnesses, three categories of witnesses, lay witnesses, official witnesses, and expert witnesses. They give testimony that is oral evidence. And there are instances where documents are also produced in evidence. Then it becomes a documentary evidence. You don't go into court. Witnesses don't go into court and make long speeches. They merely answer questions put to them by lawyers. This testimony is treated as evidence by the judge and he will finally arrive at a decision. Now, just one more slide before I turn on to your questions. 
throughout the world, ladies and gentlemen, there are different systems of justice, different systems relating to the administration of justice and relating to judicial adjudication. This right relates to those systems. So you have national systems of administration of justice. World over, there are two national systems, the adversarial system and the inquisitorial system. Sri Lanka has the adversarial system because we are part of the Commonwealth. You remember the common law system, adversarial. The two parties fight it out. Japan has the inquisitorial system where the judge is much more than an umpire. He, he actively questions uh, witnesses and strives to ascertain the truth. So these are national systems, adverse system and the inquisitorial system. Uh, there is also the Islamic, there is also the Islamic system of justice and also the communist system of justice. So they are altogether four systems, but the two main systems are the adversarial system and the inquisitorial system. Then you have international courts and tribunals. Um, that is like the International Court of Justice, ICJ in The Hague, in Netherlands, where disputes between countries are decided. Then you have ad hoc tribunals, courts developed by the international community to cater to certain specific situations, like the Nuremberg Tribunal and the Japan War Crimes Tribunal in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. That's the Nuremberg Tribunal in Germany and the Japan War Crimes Tribunal in Tokyo. Then the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia and the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda uh, to respond to two specific situations that arose in the Balkans and in Rwanda in the early 90s. And then the International Criminal Court, ICC, uh, also in The Hague. Then, since of somewhat recent origin, there are times when international law and international justice is sought to be given effect to by local courts. That's a very technical area. So these are the different systems of justice around the world domestic systems and international systems. Um, I can take your questions. Dr. Premaradna, I can take uh, questions from students. Yes, thank you, sir. Students, you can uh, unmute your mic and ask the questions directly, or you can put your question into the chat box. Yes, please go ahead, uh, students. Sir, there is one question from uh, one student. Let me open it, uh, yes, Dr. Primula. Yes. So I believe everybody can um, see this question that has been posed. Do the principles of natural justice always apply in medical negligence cases? Do the principles of natural justice always apply in medical negligence cases or is it or can be biased when evidence, uh, 
evidence is given by medical experts. Uh, I'm not too sure as to what is in fact meant by this question. Um, if what you're inquiring is um, whether doctors can give evidence in favor of their own professional, yes, that's, that's a possibility. A doctor called now in a medical negligence case, uh, a person who has suffered due to medical negligence or his family member will sue a doctor who is alleged to have committed medical negligence, acted in a negligent way, maybe in treating a patient or conducting an operation. So the, the plaintiff, the victim party, will have to establish medical negligence and for that purpose, would have to call uh, one or more expert witnesses uh, to prove the allegation of medical negligence. Not always, but sometimes it may be necessary. Um, theoretically speaking, yes, there is a possibility of such doctor being partial. But once again, the plaintiff may not uh, call a doctor without initially interviewing. At least the plaintiff's lawyer will not call a doctor to give evidence for the plaintiff unless he is sure that the doctor will give truthful evidence and good competent uh, expert evidence. S certain medical negligence cases can be proven even without expert evidence. Uh, there have been some cases where what really happened is presented to court uh, through cogent and reliable testimony, evidence, and then the court is invited to arrive at an inference that harm had been caused due to negligence on the part of the defendant doctor. Thereafter, the responsibility will shift to the defendant doctor to establish that he was not negligent. I hope I answered um, your question. So there is another question. Uh, mm -hmm. Shall I share with everyone? I got it directly from one of the students from the faculty of law. Okay, you may post it here on the chat box, Dr. Okay, Pevlan. sir. Okay, sir. I posted it, sir. Yes, so uh, hopefully everybody can see that question. The this country, Sri Lanka, we can't apply international law directly. So, sir, how can we apply it for our domestic legal system? Okay, now particularly for the benefit of those who may not uh, know or understand uh, as to what is meant by a dualist country in law based on the relationship between the legal system of a country and international law. Countries are divided into two groups, dualist countries and monist countries dualist countries and monist countries. So in dualist countries, international law is over there, outside. You have national municipal law within the country. Now, representatives of the country go out for international meetings, like meetings of the United Nations, and they negotiate and adapt conventions and treaties, and they sign. That is new international law, maybe on environment, maybe on international cooperation, on international trade, etc. Now, how does that new treaty-based international law come into our country or whatever country? Now, 
if the country is a monist country, automatically, no sooner representatives of that country sign the treaty or the convention, the substance of that convention or treaty gets automatically incorporated into the national legal system. That is the key feature of a monist country. Now, in a dualist country, just because the country's uh, representatives sign up to an international treaty or a convention, notwithstanding it being formally ratified within the country under the domestic legal system, that new international law does not get automatically incorporated into national law. For that to happen, apart from formally signing or what, voting for that international convention, <laughs> new international convention or treaty, in addition to ratifying it within the country, that law has to be specifically brought into the country through a national law. That is referred to as enabling legislation. Enabling legislation. Until enabling legislation is enacted, that new international law does not get automatically incorporated into national law. So that is a feature of a dualist country. International law versus domestic law, dual, a dual system. Now, in the case of Nallaratnam Singharasa versus Attorney General, Nallaratnam Singharasa versus Attorney General, it was held by uh, Supreme Court of uh, Sri Lanka that Sri Lanka has a dualist legal system not monist, but a dualist legal system. And into the country by enabling legislation. However, however, there are indirect inroads by which international legal norms can get incorporated or recognized by domestic law. And I'll just give you one example. That is when judges are called upon to provide interpretations to domestic legal provisions when judges are called upon to interpret written law of this country, they can invariably take into consideration international legal norms. So that's a, it's not a direct way by which international law comes into the country. It's a very delicate and indirect way in which uh, international legal norms uh, come into the domestic legal system. However, in view of the fact that Sri Lanka is a dualist country, to cause justiciability of international legal norms in Sri Lankan courts, to have them justiciable, it is indeed necessary to enact enabling legislation. So there is another question. I'm going to post it. Yes. So is it visible, sir? Yes, it is visible, Dr. Premier.
Um, so this this question relates to, um, I believe my, my understanding is the question itself isn't all that clear, but I assume the question is, now Sri Lanka is a common law country, and therefore what we have is the adversarial system of justice. And I did say that in adversarial systems of justice, the judge's role is that of an umpire. In inquisitorial systems, the judge is much more than umpire. He has this additional responsibility of actively searching through, examining witnesses and ascertaining the truth. So he has a very progressive and proactive role in inquisitorial systems. Now, having said that, it appears, I would say, that gradually the distinction between adversarial systems of justice and inquisitorial is narrowing and the distinction is becoming rather blurred. I say that because there are more and more legal provisions being created by parliament, being enacted by parliament, conferring on our own judges that inquisitorial, very active and dynamic role as well. Take, for example, uh, partition cases, uh, type of land cases called partition cases. The district judge, quite independent of the evidence that is presented by the parties to the case, has the responsibility of investigating title. He has to actively get down evidence mainly documentary evidence, question witnesses, and determine who actually owns this land that is to be divided into parts. And that is referred to as investigation of title. Now that typically converts this umpire judge into the role of an investigator or an inquirer. Take, for example, magisterial inquests into deaths governed by chapter 30 of the Code of Criminal Procedure Act. The magistrate's role is to inquire and determine the apparent cause of death. Take, for example, the conduct of a void eye inquiry within a trial to determine the admissibility of a disputed item of evidence. The role of the judge is that of an inquiry. And in any case, both in terms of the Code of Criminal Procedure Act and the Civil Procedure Code, the judge can call witnesses and examine them for the purpose of facilitating the administration of justice. And therefore, I would think this classical distinction between adversarial systems of justice and inquisitorial systems of justice is gradually getting blurred, and the two systems gradually merging. That, that it's a continuing, but a very slow process. Hope I, I adequately answered your question. <laughs> Sir, excuse me, there are five questions together. Mm -hmm. uh, what shall I do? Shall I post one by one? Or <laughs> by what time do you want to stop? Uh, Sir, 4.30? I need to, of course, stop sharp by 4.30 because I have another ah. commitment. Uh, one thing we can do, Ratna, is for you to email me the ah, five yes. questions okay. together. And okay. we'll send it across to the students within the coming two or three days the most. Yes, sir. Okay. Then, students, yes, uh, I hope you, you have common email address. You rock your email address. Please uh, send me. Uh, the, all the questions that you have, then uh, I will uh, forward it to uh, Honorable Justice uh, Yasanta Poda, good sir. Mm. Yeah, students, thank you very much for sending uh, questions.
So one of our student, uh, Rashini, is going to uh, give the vote of thanks. All right. Okay. So, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to deliver the word of thanks on behalf of the students of the short course on cultural linkages towards their ancient ideology. First, I would like to thank our guest lecturer, His Lordship, Honorable Justice Dasanta Koda Goda, for sharing his time and knowledge with us for delivering today's lecture amidst his busy schedule. So we are blessed to have you contribute to this course. Next, I wish to thank Dr. Hemanta Premaratna and the other staff of KDU who have brought these lectures together. Last but not least, I thank all participants from our university for joining us today. Your participation has made this lecture a successful event and I believe it has provided you with an insight into the law, dispute resolution and adjudication. To conclude, let me once more express my gratitude to His Lordship, Honorable Justice Yasanta Kodagoda for accepting our invitation and delivering today's lecture. So it is an honor to have you with us and your time and efforts are deeply appreciated.